Hello again. Welcome. This is the third and final lesson in the theology of the Bible. In lesson number two, we broke down for you four characteristics of the Bible. How the Bible is God's Word, it is understandable, mm -hmm. it is necessary, and it is enough. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about how we got the Bible. Maybe more specifically, we're going to talk about why the books of the Bible we have should be in there mm. and why no more should be added. Theologians usually use the word canon to talk about this stuff. No, no, no. <laughs> Not like Civil War kind of canon, but canon with one N. It comes from a Greek word that, you, that means measuring rod or like a school ruler. When we talk about the canon of scripture, we're talking about the collection of writings that are God's direct communication to us that we use to measure everything else by. So what tools do we use to think about what books should be in this canon mm. and what books shouldn't be there? Mm. Well, the first thing that we need to recognize and understand is that humans don't decide what's canonical and mm. what's not. You know, there have been church councils throughout church history, and some people think that it was these councils that put books in the canon, picking this one or that one, mm -hmm. and even taking books out. But humans don't have the authority to do that. Not even councils with bishops and patriarchs and popes. We don't make a book God's word. We recognize a book as God's word. Yeah. So how do we recognize God's word? Theologians have come up with really just two major things that we're looking for. We're looking for a claim to authority and for doctrinal consistency. Mm. So what does that mean? Well, when we're looking at a book of the Bible, we need to ask, does this book claim to be God's word? Mm. And if it does, is the theology in that book consistent with what the rest of the Bible says about God and humanity and salvation? We're looking for a claim to authority and for doctrinal consistency. So how does all of that work out? Well, we can take the Bible in two separate chunks when we're thinking about the canon. The Old Testament and the New Testament were written in really two different eras, and so we can think about them separately. So let's take the Old Testament first and ask our questions. Is there a claim somewhere that says the books of the Old Testament are God's word? And the answer is a huge <laughs> yes. Yeah. The very first chapter of Genesis claims to record God actually speaking words into existence. And God said, let there be light. This is the book of Genesis claiming to have the very words of God in it. Mm -hmm. And there are other places in the Old Testament where we actually see God speaking. God in the storm on Mount Sinai is a good example. But kind of surprisingly, those parts of the Old Testament are, are pretty few. It doesn't happen very often that we see God actually speaking. But something that's more consistent throughout the Old Testament is this idea that at certain times, God has put his spirit mm -hmm. in certain people to declare his word and to write it down. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God choosing people to speak through. Mm. Sometimes those people are called prophets. Mm -hmm. Moses fits into that category. He's a prophet and he wrote down the first five books of the Bible. Samuel is a prophet. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all the minor prophets. These guys were given words to say by God and they declared them and they wrote them down. Anytime we see a prophet in the Old Testament, we're seeing someone claiming that they are giving us God's words. At other times, God speaks through kings like David and mm -hmm. Solomon or through generals like Joshua or priests like Ezra mm -hmm. or governors like Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Everywhere throughout the Old Testament, we see people claiming that they're communicating on behalf of God. Mm -hmm. So they're claiming authority. And so what about the New Testament? Once we get to Matthew, we shift from talking a lot about prophets to talking about apostles. The claim that New Testament writers make is that they were with Jesus or were close to someone who knew Jesus and that Jesus specifically chose them to speak on his behalf. 
The authority claimed by almost all of the New Testament books is that they were written by men that God specifically chose to communicate the truth about Jesus. There are even a couple of places where New Testament books call other New Testament books mm, scripture. Right. In 2 Peter 3.16, Peter is writing about Paul's letters, and he says that the ignorant and unstable twist them to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Mm. So that's huge. Peter is lumping Paul's letters in with all of scripture. Another place is 1 Timothy 5.18, where the Apostle Paul quotes from the Gospel of Luke, and he calls it Scripture. He calls it God's Word. So the Bible, over and over again, claims that it has God's authority because God has put His Spirit in certain people to declare His Word mm -hmm. and to write it down. But what about doctrinal consistency? Well, we could take all day long to talk about how every part of the Bible talks about God beautifully and consistently. Mm -hmm. It all works together to give us this whole big picture of who God is and what He wants from us. But doctrinal consistency is actually one of the big reasons why a lot of books don't make it into the canon of Scripture. Every now and again, you'll hear about the Gospel of Thomas. It'll make a headline in the news. And some folks will act like it's got something to add to our picture of Jesus. The problem is that it has some pretty big doctrinal inconsistencies in it. We'll just give you one of them. Listen to this crazy <laughs> statement that closes out the Gospel of Thomas. Quote, Simon Peter said to them, Let Mary go away from us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, Lo, I shall lead her, so that I may make her a male, that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who makes herself a male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. So, this is a piece of doctrine that clearly contradicts so many other parts of Scripture that it cannot be considered Scripture. And the vast majority of the church has never recognized it as being part of the canon. Whoa! Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that noise means that it's time for one of our favorite criticisms of Christianity. Beautiful. So, one thing that's often said about the Bible is that you can't trust it. Mm -hmm. Some people say that it's been changed so many times from the original that what we have is just a, a big confused mess. Let me just throw some numbers at you. We have about 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. Mm. If we were to take one of those manuscripts and compare the other 4,999 manuscripts to that one, we would come up with around 400,000 places that all of those manuscripts would disagree with our one. Wow, that seems like a lot, right? That seems huge. Bart Ehrman, who is very critical of Christianity, has said, there are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. And that's true. But here's the deal. <laughs> Over 70% of those variations are spelling differences, ah. like <laughs> spelling the name of John in Greek with one N or two Ns. Mm. Those aren't meaningful differences. They don't change our understanding of the text. In fact, only about 1% of all the variations would have any effect on the meaning of the text. But listen to this. There are no variations between the manuscripts of the New Testament that change any central doctrine of Christianity, not one. None of our theology is changed by these variations. So, what does all of that mean? <laughs> All of this, the canon, the variants, all of that stuff means that the Bible we have is reliable, trustworthy, and good. You can trust the Bible. Mm. For 2,000 years, the church has affirmed that these books are God's word. We recognize that God has spoken through his prophets and apostles, and that those words are written down for us in a book that is good and true. 
If you want to know more about the canon of Scripture, we have a few resources for you. First, there are whole books written as introductions to the Old and New Testaments, and they usually have really good sections on the canon. Just a couple of them for you. One of them is called The Cradle, The Cross, and The Crown, and it's an intro to the New Testament. Really highly recommend that for you if you want to dive into how the New Testament was composed and where it came from and even introductions to the books. There's also one called A Survey of the Old Testament. Mark and I both used it in seminary. Again, it's a, it's a helpful book that introduces you to all of the books of the Old Testament, but also gives you some background information for some of those things. I've also got two books for you that have chapters about the canon. Mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of apologetics books uh, with specific spots that address the canon. So the first is mm -hmm. Another Gospel by Alyssa Childers. Uh, she's actually a former member of the band Zoe Girl, and Alyssa Childers wrote this book because she grew up as a Christian, and then she went through sort of a deconstruction of her faith, where she began to question a lot of what she believed, and in that she pursued, she researched, she studied, and she came out a stronger believer, mm -hmm. and here's a lot of what she found. Uh, there's a chapter in it called, For the Bible Tells Me So with a question mark, mm -hmm. uh, for the Bible tells me so. So that chapter is really good on the canon. This one is A Doubter's Guide to Jesus by John Dixon. Uh, there's a chapter called Sources, How We Know What We Know About Jesus, and that will tell you a lot about the reliability of the New Testament. This book is a little more heavy, a little more dense, and there's actually a lot of really cool um, ancient documents that are quoted at the end of uh, each chapter, which mm -hmm. is great. So that's all we've got for you for this lesson and for the theology of the Bible. We hope that your discussion time is good. We'll see you later. What a horrible name. Mount Doom. Think of the depth of language Tolkien has in his world. And then the big place you got to get to. I don't know. Doom Mountain? Mount, Mount Doom. Mount Bad Darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You expect more from a guy like Tolkien. Wow. <laughs> Who wrote one of the most influential pieces of literature <laughs> yeah. in English language? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. You just expect more out of the guy. Yeah. <laughs>